And joining me now is the Reverend Al Sharpton, president of the National Action Network and host of Politics Nation on MSNBC. And David Korn, bureau chief for Mother Jones and an MSNBC political analyst. And Rev, I do want to start with you because you know Rudy Giuliani. You've known him for a long time. It's interesting because the way that uh, I kind of looked at Donald Trump is that he was like a national Rudy. Like, he behaved nationally the way Rudy behaved toward New Yorkers. Uh, those of us who lived in New York experienced it. He was sort of a mini Trump. But to what extent do you think, just knowing both of these men, to what extent was Rudy influencing Trump to believe the lies and conspiracy theories that he at least claims to believe? Well, it is clear that Trump's whole political behavior was one he learned watching Rudy Giuliani and, uh, and, and the New York political scene of bullying people, of racial division, one against the other. And I think that uh, because in many ways Donald Trump learned the trade of politics, uh, looking at a guy like Rudy, Rudy probably had a lot of influence on how uh, Donald Trump was going to react to losing an election. And also because Rudy Giuliani was a, a heralded U.S. attorney and then became America's mayor, he had the credentials to make advice that one could take seriously, even when you know you are motivated by your own ego in the terms of Trump to uh, almost want to finish the lines that Rudy feeds you. But you have the comfort of knowing here's this very credible, great figure that knows law saying, yes, this theory, yes, this theory. And the desperation that Rudy Giuliani showed in trying to attach himself to uh, uh, Donald Trump, whether it was because he wanted limelight, no one knows. But the fall that he has taken and has not been able to at any point abort the fall, yes, it's been slow, but it's been steady. At no point did he try to catch himself and save his own legacy. And here we sit looking at a civil jury waiting to see how much he must pay in money that reportedly he will not have anyway. But he still has a criminal trial. None of us that were critical of him during his years as mayor when he had a very hostile relationship with the black community, particularly in New York, could have predicted that Rudy would fall this far and this fast. Right. I mean, and David, I mean, the thing is, it is spectacular in the sense that this guy was a U.S. attorney. Like, it, it, he knows the law. He prosecuted RICO cases, yet he was willing to commit felonies. He was willing to be clown himself by going overseas to try to prove this cockamamie theory that the real theft of the election was Ukraine's trying to steal the election from Trump, just because Trump was mad that he got caught working with Russia to get elected in 2016. It's all about Trump's feelings and emotions that Rudy seems to be sort of trying to babysit and sort of put a binky in his mouth and say, no, I'll prove that all your crazy theories are true. And yet, how wild is it to you, just as a journalist watching this, that this guy mm -hmm. was willing to commit crimes, including now lying outright in a ridiculous lie against these two election workers, causing them to be humiliated and attacked and threatened with death? It's quite the narrative. He went from crusading prosecutor in New York as you noted, locking up mob bosses and Wall Street crooks, white-collar criminals. He went very hard on them, to then becoming kind of a demagogic mayor, to now a sort of clownish figure. I mean, when he was going, he was the one, according to the testimony before the House uh, January 6th committee, who basically told Trump on election night, don't concede. Go out there, say you won. There were also reports that he was a little bit inebriated at the time he did this. Uh, but I don't think Trump needed a lot of egging on to do that. But there was Rudy, a guy who used, his job used to be to lock up crooks and, 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 and respect the law, telling the president to lie about victory. And then he goes on in those months afterwards with these clownish uh, crusade. I mean, he, one highlight or low light of that whole point was when he went to Rusty Bowers, the Republican Speaker of the House in Arizona, and said he wanted him to block the electors. And Rusty said, he's testified to this, you know, um, I said, bring me the evidence, and I'll look at it. And then he flies out there with Jenna Ellis, another Trump attorney, and he shows up for the meeting, and Rusty Barris says, where's the evidence? And they look at each other, go, oh, we kind of left it in the hotel room. 
And he goes, we have theories, but we don't have a lot of evidence. And a guy who spent decades in the legal field to behave this way is almost unfathomable. I mean, I don't know what made the turn in him. I have a theory. I think it has to do with his hatred of Hillary Clinton that put him in the Trump camp. But I think an important thing to remember at this moment is he's, you know, after this, he has to deal, as the Rev noted, with this criminal case in Atlanta. There are three attorneys, former Trump attorneys, three, Kenneth Cheeseboro, uh, Sidney Powell, and Jenna Ellis, and they've all worked with Rudy in trying to overturn the election, and they all have now pleaded guilty, and they've said crimes were committed. By pleading guilty, they have conceded that in this effort to overturn the election that he led, crimes were committed. And two of those people, Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis, were at that infamous hair dyeing, uh -huh. dripping <laughs> press conference. I don't know what we call it. Yeah. And so his own comrades have said, we committed crimes. Yeah. It really leaves him on a pretty big hook. Yeah, and I mean, the thing is, Rev, I mean, I think that Rudy Giuliani is one of those people who's a triumph of substance over, over I mean, of, of form over substance, right? I mean, people thought he was this great mayor because he had one good day on 9-11, but he's also the guy uh, who, you know, was forcing the NYPD to walk his girlfriend's dogs. That's not his wife. That would be his girlfriend he was cheating with. He's the guy who announced he was going to divorce his actual wife, you know, during a TV press conference. I mean, this is not a guy uh, who was really what he said he was. He tried to stay in office for a third term illegally and said after 9-11, I'm just going to stay. That sounds like Trump. He's very similar. Then I want to read the closing argument against Rudy. It says days after Mr. Giuliani reminds you, day after day, Mr. Giuliani reminds you who he is, said Matthew Gottlieb, an attorney for the plaintiffs. Um, he said Mr. Giuliani's defense strategy was to convince jurors he was more important than the women he defamed. Rich, famous people have valuable reputations, and ordinary people are irrelevant, replaceable, worthless. Mr. Giuliani's defense is his reputation, his comfort, and his goals are more important than those of Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. This is a fiction, and it ends today. Um, There's also somebody who made money off 9-11. Let me play the, one of the voicemails left for Ruby Freeman. This was played during the trial. You're going to jail, Ruby. You're going to get locked up, Ruby. That's election fraud, Ruby. What was on the USB drive, Ruby? You're all going to f jail, you piece of f Rev, if you actually know what Rudy was like, it actually seems like this is kind of the fitting end, right? He played in racism. Racism was his stock and trade as mayor, and this is how he ends. This is just one of his many cases. And when you look at the fact that his being mayor... He was the one that championed broken windows, stop and frisk, where he did not feel that parts of the city mattered like other parts of the city, that we had no rights that anyone had to re uh, respect. He meet with black leaders when we had the shooting of Amadou Diallo, a, a young uh, man who took his key out in his best view of his house, and the police shot him at him 41 times, hitting him 19 times, and it was his key, not a gun. And Rudy wouldn't even meet with black leaders, forget black activists like me. He wouldn't meet with the state controller, but the Manhattan Borough president at the time. He has always operated like it's us against them, and we are more important. And now the irony, I would say, uh, what happens in karma and with God's will is two black women yep. are the first to legally bring him where the black community uh, suffered in his in his being mayor. Yeah. Uh, it's ironic that that two black women that he thought were marginal and unimportant, mm. and he couldn't even take the stand and testify. Let's remember, he said he was going to take the stand. He was going to be able to stand up to all of this and expose the truth. And at the end, he was a no-show. He went from being a champion to being Roberto du Duran. Mm. No mas, no mas. That's mm. what happened today and, to Rudy Giuliani. And there you go. Last word to you on this, David Korn. Let's put up a list of all that he's got to face. The Georgia 2020 election, federal trial, his unpaid legal fees. He's being sued by his former lawyer, Robert Costello. Sexual assault and harassment charges. These are really gross. The things he did to a former employee named Noel Dumphy and also this defamation charge that could bankrupt him. Um, your thoughts on the, the twilight of Rudy Giuliani? You know, I've always thought that one of the smallest type of person one can be is a bully. To use your power to punch down, and that's what he did with Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. 
He thought, and I think the Rev, you know, just made this point that he was more important. He was bigger. He could do whatever he wanted with their lives. And these are people who are elections, election workers. You know, people like this volunteer and, and go to work across the country every day to preserve our democracy. He had no respect. He had no respect, as I noted earlier, for the rule of law mm -hmm. or for any facts. It was all whatever he could get away with because he was Rudy Giuliani. Yeah. Well, the fact that they brought down this bully uh, yeah. is finally justice. It, it, it is indeed. Uh, and we are awaiting that verdict still. Um, we'll look tomorrow. Reverend Al Sharpton, David Korn, friends, thank you very much. Time and again, we've seen the current conservative majority Supreme Court undo decades of precedent to rule in favor of Republican interests on everything from abortion to affirmative action. But now the court has a new opportunity to cater to the far right and directly help Donald Trump in one of his many criminal cases. Yesterday, the justices agreed to hear a case that will consider whether the government can charge January 6th rioters with a statute that makes it a crime to obstruct an official proceeding which could not only upend the prosecutions of hundreds of insurrectionists who've already been charged or sentenced, but could also potentially impact or delay special counsel Jack Smith's election interference case, as obstruction is one of the four counts brought against Trump. A delay is exactly what Smith was trying to avoid, when just days ago he asked the Supreme Court to fast-track a review of Trump's claim that he is immune for prosecutions of any kind, even for tr trying to forcibly stay in office, because it happened while he was president. And while it may seem like there would be a pretty obvious answer there, the people who could be deciding this are three Trump-appointed justices, along with Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. Joining me now is Melissa Murray, law professor at New York University, former clerk to Judge Sonia Sotomayor and MSNBC legal analyst. Melissa, how on earth could a case even make it to the Supreme Court that says that the government can't charge people who did insurrection with insurrection with interfering with the processes of Congress. Well, Joy, the case is called Fisher versus United States, and this January 6th rioter was charged under the statute that was actually passed in the wake of the Enron scandal. So one of the arguments that was made was that the statute was never intended to apply to a situation where someone was obstructing a congressional proceeding, but rather was meant to deal with circumstances where individuals were doing things like evidence tampering in furtherance of the obstruction of official proceedings. And so these don't necessarily match up. Mr. Fisher is also arguing that he was never in the Capitol for a long time and for that reason had no intent to actually obstruct the congressional proceedings. So it's really a question of statutory interpretation and whether the scope and substance of this statutory provision was meant to apply to this kind of conduct, the rioting at the Capitol. And how could that possibly then apply to Trump? Because Trump, at least if you read Jack Smith's filing, was directly trying to interfere with the processes of Congress since the process in question was certifying the election of somebody other than him. You know, that's exactly right. Um, I think, though, if this court is inclined to rule for Mr. Fisher that this statute does not apply to him, that it was not intended to apply to him, um, then it raises questions about whether it should be applied to Mr. Trump. And again, it is one of the four charges in that January 6th election interference indictment that Jack Smith has filed. And this really puts the Supreme Court and its conservative supermajority on their heels a bit, because this is a court that has said that you've got to look at the four corners of the statute, the words of the statute, the text of the statute. If you look at the text of the statute, I think a very natural reading of it is that it could apply in circumstances where individuals were trying to obstruct any official proceeding, whether it was something with regard to the valuation of a company or a congressional proceeding like this one. It is only if you look to the purpose of the statute and look at its origins in the Enron scandal that maybe things get a little shakier. But this is a court of committed textualists, so we'll see just how committed they are. Or it's a court of alien canons who are committed to do whatever they want, you know, and, and whatever uh, suits them in the moment, and, and especially if it helps maybe their guy, Donald Trump. Uh, let me read you, because I think Jack Smith's um, filing actually was pretty brilliant. His strategy has been really brilliant to try to cut Donald Trump off from this delay, delay, delay strategy. This is what Public Notice wrote about it. Trump's lawyers insist that the Constitution take care, Constitution's take care clause made Trump an all-purpose policeman obliged to interfere with the certification of President Biden's electoral victory. This is a particularly odd position because the 12th Amendment to the Constitution lays out specific roles for Congress and the vice president in the electoral certification, but not for the president. Um, so talk about this just for a moment, because 
It, it isn't. It is slightly unusual for the Supreme Court to skip the D.C. Circuit and to just jump before them. But it's not completely unusual, right? And is this a solid argument uh, on the part of Trump's lawyers that somehow interfering with the election is part of his job? Right. So we're pivoting from the Fisher case, which is about the January 6th charges, and now turning to Trump's efforts to delay this this trial altogether by arguing that he is immune from prosecution as a former president. What Jack Smith has done here is basically said, we can't wait for the intermediate appellate court to make a ruling here that would take too long. This country needs to know whether one of its candidates for president is a convicted felon or not. And so it is sought certiorari without judgment, um, before judgment in this case case. And it's asked the Supreme Court to not only do that, but to take this case, but to do so with incredible expedition. And the question that the court has to address is whether the scope of presidential immunity, which has never been applied in the context of a criminal case, because we have never had <laughs> a former president or a sitting president be indicted on criminal charges, but whether or not the scope of presidential immunity goes so far as to insulate a president from criminal charges. And Donald Trump is arguing that his discouragement of the counting of the votes or the certification of the votes in Congress, that was merely part of his job as president and therefore within the scope, within that outer perimeter of his duties and therefore renders him immune. Jack Smith is arguing that he wasn't even supposed to be there. That is a job for the vice president. Right. This is not part of the yeah. president's official duties. He has no immunity here. Yeah. Uh, really quickly, based on Dobbs, should we just expect that the same five who overturned uh, abortion rights will rule against Mitch? For Pristone. Should we just brace ourselves for that? I think this is going to present a real challenge for this court because Dobbs, basically, the court said that this is an issue that should be decided by the states, by the people, and yet we have a decision if the court rules in favor of the Fifth Circuit would make it very difficult for the abortion pill to be accessed around the country, even in those states where there are more liberal abortion policies. I also think it's important to note that this case is like a Venn diagram where it pits the conservatives' antipathy for abortion with their antipathy for the administrative state and gives mm. them an opportunity to really stick it to the FDA and administrative agencies. So who knows if they'll be able to resist? Yeah, and also Samuel Alito is, you know, he thinks he's doing God's work, his version of God's work. And he's just, they're going to do what they want. Oh, Melissa Murray, uh, thank you all very, thank you very much.